Sarita, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, church. And uh, so nice to be here. I mean, it's really wonderful to worship together and uh, uh, learn and grow. And uh, I'm privileged and honored to share God's message today with you. Today, we want to touch upon a very important subject, and that is hope. But we will zero in on a simple foundational question. That, that is about the source of hope. Where is your hope? Or where, who is your hope? We want to answer this question in the remainder of our time. Uh, remember, uh, hope is very important. It is vitally important for life. It is incredibly significant that we have hope. Without hope, it is difficult to live. Hope helps us to move on in life. Help, hope gives us strength to accomplish. Hope gives us the motivation, the inspiration and drive. Uh, that is by, that is by the, oh, so sorry, I'm so sorry. I beg your pardon. I'm so sorry. I was totally unaware. Uh, brethren, hope, hope is vitally important. It is incredibly significant. Without hope, it is very difficult to live. Uh, that is why it is said, where there is hope, there is life. Where there is life, there is hope. Uh, hope springs eternally in the human breasts. So the question that we want to ask today is, where is your hope? What is the source of your hope? Uh, to answer this question, let's take, let's look at the negative aspect first, where our hope should not be, where we should not place our hope. Uh, let me look, uh, give a few points. Riches and wealth. Can you and I place our hope in our riches and wealth? Um, definitely not. This is very dangerous. Uh, I remember recently, uh, a decade ago, uh, many banks went into hot water and they all trembled like a deck of cards. Remember the Prudential Bank, the Charminar Bank, and even Punjab National Bank uh, was in doldrums. Brethren, it is not safe to put your, to put place your trust in riches and wealth. God says, if you have hope in this life only, then we are men most miserable. Brethren, we need to seek those things that are about what can you and I place our hopes in the powers that be uh, just about a week back uh, a dear friend of mine was talking to me and she said it is so difficult to get things done in the government in the powers that be uh, uh, levels everywhere there is bureaucracy everywhere there is red tape brethren the powers that be cannot deliver uh, goods we need to be we need to be clear about it what about science and technology? Uh, yes, we have made fantastic, incredible progress, but still we face a lot of hurdles. Uh, look at the novel virus and its, and its variants. It is almost more than a one and a half years and we still struggle with this, uh, to struggle to conquer this. Yes, we have conquered smallpox, we have co conquered cataract, but still we are yet to make a breakthrough. But more important, science and technology has limitations. It cannot answer the basic big questions of life. What do I mean by big questions? Uh, where did we come from? Uh, what's life all about? Is there meaning? Is there purpose? Is there significance? What happens when our lives get folded up? Science is inherently weak. It cannot answer these questions. These questions are beyond its scope and magnet scope. That is why we say science and technology. It is not safe to put your uh, hope in science and technology. And so where should we put our hopes? Brethren, I like one particular verse in the Bible which says, if you have hope in this life only, then we are most miserable. In general terms, we are being told that do not place your hope on things of the earth. Seek those things that are above. Brethren, to answer this question more clearly, our scriptural passage uh, read by Hasni, and uh, thank you Hasni, was from uh, Jeremiah chapter 32, verses one to three, and verses uh, six to 15. Uh, this, this is a story 
that this is a story that was narrated by Jeremiah. God told Jeremiah to do something unusual, very strange. Uh, remember uh, the uh, background? Uh, Jeremiah himself is under house arrest, and uh, the uh, the city at the gates, the, uh, the Babylonians, the enemies are going to crash in. Uh, short, very with, within within let's say a few days they're going to crash, and your city is going. To, Jerusalem is going to be run over, and they are going to be burnt down, and it's going to be brought to shambles. And at this point, God is telling Jeremiah to uh, buy a land. Uh, to buy the land. Uh, uh, I hope I got it. Verse six, six says, verse six says, yeah, God is asking him to buy a piece of land. His cousin comes to him and he's, he sells the land and, God, and Jeremiah buys this piece of land. Uh, Jeremiah, he has not seen the land that he's going to purchase and he is sure that the Babylonians are going to run over and he will lose the land. So the, the deed, the, the purchase deed that he has, and he, which he wants to hand it over to his servant, will, will have no meaning or no significance. But God, brethren, is teaching you and teaching Jeremiah and the people of Israel a very important lesson. The, that lesson is found in verse 15. It's verse 15. It says, for thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall be possessed again in this land. Brethren, it's a beautiful message. Even though it's a very strange story, even though it doesn't make sense to buy a piece of land at this juncture, God is saying, I am your future. I am your hope. Brethren, we are told in clear terms that God is our hope. And uh, uh, Jeremiah wants to invest his money and in this particular purchase of this land. Jeremiah is not making an investment in his future. Jeremiah is making an investment in the future. Uh, you will remember that uh, God told, uh, God is the one who takes care of us. He is the one who takes care of our circumstances, our situation, no matter what. And God says, I am your hope. Brethren, God is our hope. He is the one who takes care of our future. Uh, to make this point, uh, let me digress and quote one scripture, a favorite scripture, which the apostle Paul wrote. Uh, remember, Paul writes, faith and now abide, faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Brethren, what, what we learn from this particular passage is God is love. Because God is love, we live in, we believe in love, we act in love, and we live in love. Similarly, brethren, God is our hope. And because God is our, our hope, he is the, he's our living hope, we believe in hope, we act in hope, and we live in hope. Brethren, and so let us go on to uh, see more carefully how to understand this particular story. Jeremiah believed in hope. And because he believed in hope, you and I, brethren, we do need to believe in hope. Uh, God, Jeremiah did, uh, did purchase the land, not because the prices were at the rock bottom as, or as a psychological defense mechanism against the, against the reality of the imminent invasion but because Jeremiah purchased the land because he believed in the future. Yes, he was living under terrible times. Dark, darkness was closing around him and his, his, the, the city is going to come in ruins. Yet, brethren, Jeremiah learned to trust God. Brethren, we need to understand something in life. Life is much more complex than darkness and gloom. Yes, you will have difficulties, you will have uh, sorrows. But remember, who is controlling the circumstances? Who is controlling the situations? Who is taking care of your future? Brethren, Jeremiah understood that it was God Almighty. And because it was God Almighty in whose hands his future and the future of his nation rested, he was able to uh, believe God. Similarly, brethren, you and I need to believe God. Brethren, when God saves something, it is for our good. Jeremiah's prophecy 
Jeremiah's prophecy tells Israel that there is a cause for hope. It is also a message, a message that should give us hope. Brethren, just as Jeremiah trusted and just as he, he signed, he believed in, in selling, in buying the plot, brethren, we do need to take God at his word. Why? Because, brethren, God knows us. God is the one who is who's in control. He takes care of you. He takes care of your needs. Brethren, the same God loved you even before the foundations of the world. Uh, Jesus came as a little baby 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem. He comes to us today by the Spirit and he, he will come again to bring a glorious future for you and for me. Brethren, Jesus is the Savior of the world, the whole of humanity, and in him we have hope. And so the first point I want to leave you with, let's believe God. He is our hope. Uh, just a few chapters before uh, this, uh, uh, God also gave his message to the elders who were held captive. We read uh, in an earlier chapter, Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, God says, God conveyed this message through Jeremiah. I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Brethren, the elders in exile received a message of hope, a message of joy. They came to realize that God is their hope. Similarly, brethren, you and I need to realize, brethren, to believe God and to trust him. What is the second thing that uh, Jeremiah did? Jeremiah not only believed in hope, he also acted on his hope. He acted on his hope. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, take these deeds, both the sealed deed of purchase and the open deed, and put them in earthen where jars in order that they may last for a long time. Brethren, by his action of buying, Jeremiah is, 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 Jeremiah is demonstrating his trust and hope in the God. Dude, hope was not a strange feeling. He did, Jeremiah took concrete steps to show, to demonstrate his hope. This is not an investment in his future, but it is an investment in the future. In this particular action, brethren, Jeremiah shows that God's maths and God's reality does not run by our rules. Jeremiah acted in hope leaning on God's promises, that promises of that houses and fields and vineyards shall be brought again in this land. God told Jeremiah to be a, buy a piece of land, a land which he has not seen, a land which he knows that he's going to lose it. From a human perspective, I'm sure now this particular transaction doesn't make sense. Brethren, he brought a piece of land and, and gave the deed to his servant Barak, Baruch, for safekeeping. G. Jeremiah was taking part in a revolutionary act of hope. This is the hope in action. What does hope in action look for us, for you and for me? Brethren, we don't live by the global, by the world standards. We live, our rules are set by God Almighty. He is the one who, who tells us how to live. And so brethren, how, how do we demonstrate our uh, our hope in action. Brethren, every time we choose to give our donations and our offerings to the church, what is the message we are conveying? We are saying, Lord, you are in charge of, our, of, our, of my finances, of our finances, and we want to share uh, in the generosity you have given us. We want to share the wealth you have given us. And then another example I can share with you is Every, every day we choose to love people, even those closest to us. What is the message we are conveying? Instead of reacting in, a, in an angry mood or in a harsh mood for the frustration or disappointment they cause, we choose to share God's love for them. We share God's love not because of what they do. We share God's love because of who they are. They are God's beloved children. And so, brethren, let us not only believe in, let believe in hope, 
let us also learn to live let us let, let, let us learn to act in hope now let me share with you the last point jeremiah lived in hope brethren god wants that you and i too will live in hope brethren jeremiah put his deed in an earthenware jar and generations past have put their symbols of their lives in time capsules and buried them the time capsule for you and for me brethren is not something that is buried it is the cross of jesus the cross of jesus is the symbol that reminds you and me that we believe in hope act in hope and live in hope this is the message of hope that sin and despair and gloom does not prevail but god will help you and take care of everything and there will be times of seasons of spring there will be times of harvest there will be times of peace and joy brethren every time we get down in praying either in our personal prayers or in our family prayers or in our collective prayers we are conveying an important message we are saying lord thy will be done thy kingdom come we are upholding the kingdom values we are advancing his kingdom on this planet earth every time brethren we converge week after week in worship we are conveying an important message we are declaring that we live by kingdom values we and we we are saying lord hasten the coming of your kingdom a time when there will be peace and prosperity joy and unprecedented success glory for all brethren as as god's very own children we live in hope every day and we look forward to a time when god is good as god is going to bring prosperity for everyone and life eternal all we have now no matter how good it is in the ultimate analysis let us remember that it is transient and temporal conversely all that we experience now in this life are not the final answers it does not define us i think the fundamental point to understand about uh, living in hope is uh, do you know an important factor and that factor is do you know your true identity brethren you and i need to know our true identity if someone has mistreated you or ignored you does that establish your you know the world and he has a glorious future for you is it possible that you and i go through struggles trials difficulties sickness and then problems if so brethren can these factors can these factors decrease can they erase our identity can they can they demolish our identity absolutely not brethren god has chosen us and if we are the jewel of his of his creation god loves us and because of that god takes care of us in the year and now and he says i am your future i am your hope brethren jesus christ is our jesus christ came to give you and me hope and if we and we need to believe in that hope and we need to act on the hope we need to live in that hope our true identity brethren when you and i know our true identity the our identity belongs brings along with it hope the identity and the hope it brings affects our living everyday living and we make we make changes we automatically make changes knowing and trusting who we are changes every moment in our lives brethren let's rejoice and let's praise god jesus did come he is coming now in the spirit and he will come again bringing the fullness of his kingdom a glorious future for you for me and for all of humanity brethren and so brethren let's rejoice and let's thank god let's live our lives in the light of the truth hope in believing hope in action and hope 
been living. Amen. Uh, may I ask Praveen to play a video at this point? Jesus is the master storyteller. In the middle of Luke's gospel, Jesus is telling a series of stories to a collective group of religious and non-religious folks. One particular story is about the rich man and the poor man, Lazarus. Let's examine the strange dialogue that takes place. It is curious and revealing how Jesus goes to some length to describe the temporal details. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. There's some important details to notice here. In that society, purple dye was incredibly expensive and a sign of being wealthy. It served no purpose except to show people you had wealth and to make an impression, to be seen. In contrast, Lazarus, someone the rich man would have seen at his gate every day, was poor, dirty, and forgotten. There were a lot of unseen people when Jesus walked. Slavery was commonplace. There were many poor. Not all slaves or poor were abused, but they were ignored unknown and unseen. The rich man, however, was known. Both died, but Jesus only shares the rich man speaking, who says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. Just in that first phrase, he's proven that he still doesn't get it. He ignores Lazarus, the poor man, as he did every day of his life. He talks over him like he has always done. Then he addresses Abraham like a peer and asks him to treat the poor man like a slave. Tell your boy to do something for me. Abraham denies him and the man persists. He said then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Again, he's giving orders. Again, he's ignoring the poor man. He still doesn't get the picture. The hierarchy of the world, the social structures of the world don't apply in the kingdom. The poor man, the forgotten man, can no longer be ignored. The story begs us to examine who we admire or idolize in contrast to whom we ignore or leave at the gate. Who do we walk by in our purple robes with our bellies full? As we unwrap this parable, we notice another detail. Only Lazarus is named. Of the two main characters here, Jesus only gives one of them a name. The poor man, the excluded man, the unimportant man is made visible by the Lord. Jesus sees the unseen of this world. Do we? May God open our eyes to see others as he sees them, and then to share his love and life with those we see. I'm Greg Williams, speaking of life. <laughs>